Good afternoon, everyone. I haven't been up here since convocation. It looks a little different by the light of day. And you're all clothed. Um, so my name is Donna Lisker. I came to Smith in July of this year to become the new dean of the college. My job has many perks. I get to eat in the campus dining halls as much as I want. Some houses, go Capen, have started inviting me to tea. <clears throat> and I have a stained glass window in my office. And if you don't believe me, come see it sometime. All of that is great, but I believe that my friends, every one of whom is an Orange is the New Black fan, are insanely jealous of what I'm getting to do today. So we are thrilled to welcome back to Smith two distinguished alumni, writer Beth Ann Kelly Patrick, 85, and writer and activist Piper Kerman, 92. Beth Ann and Piper will be coming to the stage very shortly to have a conversation. Before I introduce them, let me remind you that following their conversation, there will be time for audience questions. You'll note that there are microphones in the aisles, or there will be, I can't really see yet whether there are. Um, where audience members can line up to ask questions. The program will be followed by a book signing out in the foyer, and there are already books for sale if you forgot your copy. Our co-sponsors today are Friends of the Smith College Libraries and the Student Event Committee. Proceeds from ticket sales will benefit the Women's Prison Association. If you haven't already, please take a moment to silence your phone. So now let me briefly introduce Beth Ann and Piper. You'll learn much more about them in their actual conversation. So our interview, Beth Ann Kelly Patrick, class of 1985, was recently named one of the top 35 writers who run the literary internet by Flavorwire. She's a writer, author, and journalist, but above all, a reader, one who has created a platform around books and publishing and how those things are changing. After graduating from Smith, Ms. Patrick received her master's degree in English from the University of Virginia. She's currently books editor at Washingtonian Magazine. Several years ago, she created the popular Friday Reads hashtag on social media, and that's attracted thousands of book lovers. She's published in newspapers, magazines, journals, and websites, including the Washington Post, the Oprah Magazine, Virginia Quarterly Review, and others. She's also interviewed over 300 authors for her WETA PBS affiliate show, The Book Studio. She's written two titles from National Ge Geographic Books, An Uncommon History of Common Things and An Uncommon History of Common Courtesy. She lives in Northern Virginia. Our second speaker today, who, whose name you will all recognize, is Piper Kerman, who we're delighted to welcome back to Smith. This fall, she's talking to college and university audiences across the country about her experiences in a federal women's prison and the need for change in our federal prisons. As a student, Piper Kerman lived in Chapin House and Hopkins House. Just so you know. She worked for dining services, she became a theater major, and she graduated in 1992. Following graduation, she stayed on in the Valley and worked in a variety of jobs close to Smith. She started dating a woman who one day asked her to carry a suitcase full of money, payment for a West African drug lord, on a flight from Chicago to Brussels. Five years later, Kerman was apprehended as part of a drug ring and eventually served 11 months at the Federal Correctional Facility in Danbury, Connecticut. Her experiences there led her to pen her best-selling memoir, Orange is the New Black, My Year in a Women's Prison. Now, you've probably heard that title because it was, it was adapted by Genji Cohan into the popular Netflix series of the same name. The show's won a Peabody Award, three Emmys, and is nominated for six more Emmys this year. These days, Piper Kerman lives in New York and is an activist on behalf of women in prison. Please help me in welcoming Piper Kerman and Beth Ann Patrick back to Smith. Crowd, it's true. So exciting to see you all here. Thank you, thank you so much for coming out this afternoon. And I had so many questions to ask Piper that I need to. I don't know. Can you hear me? Yes. It's clearly it's Beth Ann's mic. Oh. It's my problem. There you go. Yeah. 
Okay. Okay. Well, I was sitting on something, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's such a thrill for me to be here. Okay. Yes. All right, I'm just going to hold it. <laughs> there we go. So, uh, as I was saying, I don't want to ask so many questions that there isn't time for yours. I know there will be plenty of them. So, I don't need to give you very much more introduction to our speaker today, Piper Kerman. And the first thing I want to ask you, Piper, is Chapin or Hopkins? Chapin or Hopkins? Both. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I lived in Sorry. Chapin. Well, it might be both of us. <laughs> I lived in Chapin House for the first uh, two years and one semester of my Smith career. Um, and then I left Smith for a year, and when I came back, I moved into Hopkins House, and I love them both. I'm a center campus gal. Excellent. <laughs> Dead. But you know what? You can hear me, right? You can hear us. Right. Yeah, we'll just talk loud. They'll come back. They'll, it, it will come back at some point. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Um, one thing I want to ask for the first part of our audience participation is how many of you have seen the TV series Orange is the New Black? <laughs> yeah. All right then. Oh, we're back. Are we back? We're back. Excellent. Thank <laughs> you. Now, Second part, how many of you have read the book, Orange is the New Black? See, yeah, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's, what, that's what I thought. So one of the things we're going to be talking about today are the differences. Those of you who have done both, watched and read, know that the stories are not completely congruous. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. But um, this isn't your first time back to Smith, Piper, is it? No, no, certainly not. Um, recently, I came back for my 20th reunion. Woo! Oh, my goodness. And yeah, my 25th, I'm staring my 25th in the face. Um, and that was a delightful and lovely experience. And, um, and I was mentioned briefly in Jane Lynch's con uh, you know, graduation speech, Excellent. which was a startling honor. Um, and before that, I came back in 2011 to talk about the book. After the book was published mm -hmm. in 2010, I was invited to come back and talk to students uh, at that time, and that was a thrill. Um, and like all Smithies, I'm attracted back to campus as frequently as possible. So there had been many times when I'd been back to Northampton for one reason or another okay. over the years. So this is not something that has ever been, uh, you know, uh, hard for you or um, difficult. It's always a joy to come back. It is always a joy to come back to Smith, which is one of the most remarkable communities of women in the entire world. Yes, absolutely. And it is a world <laughs> community. I got to tell you, mm -hmm. every Practically every event I've ever done in the last however many years, there's a Smithy. Or there's a bunch of Smithies. <laughs> exactly. We're everywhere. We are legion. I think this is the biggest bunch of Smithies that you and I may, you know, ever see at once. It's this is kind a big of, one, it's yeah. Really cool. It's true. It's really cool. And Mountain Day was this week, so I also wanted to make sure I asked you before we get into more substantive questions, if uh -huh. you had any Mountain Day um, traditions of your own. No traditions. I feel like we zigged and we zagged and, you know, we did some apple picking and sometimes we were just lazy and, you know. Mine was definitely lazy, lazy Mountain <laughs> Day. <laughs> but um, you lived also, um, you, you lived in um, Chapin and uh, do you have memories there, specific memories of things that happened and traditions there as well? Oh, vivid memories. Um, you know, Smith is such an amazing place, and you forge such intense friendships so quickly. Yeah. Uh, my best friend in the whole world is a woman I met, I think, the first week of college, and I met her uh, up in Sealy on the second floor. We were introduced by another first year, and she, they, she said, Piper, is that your real name? And I said, is that your real hair color? And <laughs> we have been inseparable ever since. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, but Chapin, she lived in Lawrence. Um, <laughs> there you go. Um, Chapin, I have so many fond memories. My freshman year room looked out over Paradise Pond. Oh. 
amazing, you know, just that vista every single morning. My freshman year roommate was from Seoul, South Korea. You know, it was so exciting to live with an international student. That was so cool. And there were a lot of international students in Chapin mm -hmm. that, during that time period I lived there. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's just, it's amazing. You know, back then, you know, we had very centralized dining, so one of the, the traditions I'm most fond of from that period of time was Thursday candlelight dinner, yes. and of course Friday teas. And, uh, you know, food is really central. I know when I got the notes back from my book editor to the first draft of my book, mm -hmm. she was like, you really talk about food a lot. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know, I mean, I feel like that's something I carried forward from this community of women. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it, and, and that's a really good way to put it too, because it's not always just about the food, it's about the community oh, that you share absolutely. here. And, and another part of that community that I did want to ask you about as well, is academics, mm -hmm. and uh, I know many of us feel like we're not able to take advantage of everything Smith has to offer. Mm -hmm. It's almost impossible. But um, what do you have a few um, favorite classes, professors, I, memories of oh, those things? Yes. So let's see. I was a theater major. I hear that there are some theater majors <laughs> here tonight. <laughs> Yay! Yeah. Um, I my very first semester of my first year. I was in one of the two, you know, there's, there were two sections of the Intro to Theater course, and it was taught by a woman named Kendall, who became my advisor. She was, during that period of time, also the head of the department. I have to tell you, the professor, like, she had such a profound impact on me. She had a profound mm -hmm. impact. On, I, I sort of feel like she kind of split my head open and changed the way that I regarded the world yeah. um, in really significant ways. And, uh, and I'm sure that's true for many of you with the professors that you're engaging with now because, you know, those relationships are also, totally aside from the friends you make here, right. you know, those, men, you know, the guidance and the, the kindness of those professors is really amazing. And I have to tell you that what I learned from her and certainly from the other professors in the theater department about story and about audience mm -hmm. and about what your audience wants to know, what they know already, how that relates to the story that you want to tell. I drew down on all of those things when I decided to sit down and write a memoir and write a story, you know, very intentionally thinking about what kind of impact it would have on an audience or a reader. And I am very grateful to, to Kendall and to the other professors in the theater department. I had a lot of other favorite professors. I know a couple who are, you know, Rick Fantasy is sociology class. The one sociology class I took <laughs> definitely was a really fun, great class. Um, you know, it is, you know, one of my, two of my biggest regrets in life are that I didn't take art history oh. <laughs> and that I didn't take a physics class. And that might surprise you, given some of the things about my life. <laughs> but um, the, these are the things that we miss out on. Mm -hmm. Now, you, um, were, you stayed on after graduation. Most of us know this part of the story, but I wanted to ask you about some of your favorite places in the Valley and in mm. Northampton as well, because mm -hmm. one of the things I loved is your description of how much you loved running on country roads, mm -hmm. you know, when the, when the weather was good here. And so talk to us a little bit about what your memory of being here mm -hmm. um, was like yeah, after graduation. I think one of the greatest things about going to college out here is the incredible physical beauty of the valley mm -hmm. and you know taking advantage of that is really important and um, and yeah so I did a lot of that I spent a lot of time out of doors both when I was a student and also after I after I graduated um, I would say probably my favorite place in town is still Joe's Excellent. And yeah, that is a good <laughs> pizza. Still there. Yeah, that still is there. Pizza. I mean, it long predates me, and I'm sure it'll be here a long time. You I know, hope so. Maybe long enough you know, yeah. afterwards, lady. We'll <laughs> uh, now, of course, what happened to you happened early in your life, and we were talking about how long ago it all seems mm -hmm. now. And I'm wondering when things, you know, got real with Nora mm -hmm. and when things you know took a turn when did you know that you'd reached a point where you'd made a mistake mm -hmm. um, something that might affect your life not mm -hmm. necessarily that you committed a crime or what mm -hmm. well there's no question that um, that as soon as I carried that bag 
of money from mm -hmm. Chicago to Brussels. Fully cognizant. That, well, I'm fully cognizant, but after doing it, the, the recognition, the realization that I had crossed a line that I could mm -hmm. never undo was very tangible. Mm -hmm. And so it was really a very short period of time after carrying that bag of money mm -hmm. that I ended that relationship, that I came back to the United States. You know, I went out to California where I had right. a bunch of Smithies who I Yay. reconnected with. Um, so there's no doubt that the actual, that actual fundamental act, which is depicted in the book, um, was, you know, that bright line. I would say, though, that in the months that preceded that, my life really felt very out of control, and it was really out of control. Well, um, that's another thing that I wanted to ask you, and we talked about this. You have a wonderful scene in the book where you jump into the water, Nora's uh, watching, <laughs> and you say that, you know, you were kind of crazy. And so, in talking about your life being out of control, do you feel that you really were, and when I say crazy, I'm not using it in any sort of mm -hmm. mental, mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, health kind of term, but mm -hmm. did you feel, you, you did feel out of control, you did feel that things were spiraling? Yes. You know, it's an interesting thing, you know, um, the period of your life in your teens and your early 20s is very naturally a period of time when we are more willing to take risks, when we're more willing to uh, extend our boundaries and get outside of ourselves, mm -hmm. partly because it's such a significant period of your life when you're exploring who you are right. and you're changing your definitions of who you are. Um, you know, during childhood, in many ways, we're so defined by our parents and by the family relationship and you live, you know, many of us live under our parents' roofs. And then you come to an amazing place like Smith and it fosters you along to sort of try to become your best self, or at least equip you to be your best self. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt that when I graduated from Smith, I drifted and I wandered and I was not realizing my best self. But I will say that some of the things that I learned here and the friendships that I forged here in the arc of my life helped me realize my best self. But yeah, that, that, that question of risk and risk-taking and positive risks versus negative risks, it's something that I think about so often. Right. It's so relevant to young people, you know, that, again, yes. teenage to early 20s. And we know that, you know, people are developing all kinds of aspects of their personalities, their sexuality, all kinds of things like that. Literally, we know that the brain is not done developing right. until about 25. So. Um, it's so essential to be forgiving of risk taking to young people, to encourage them to take positive risks, mm -hmm. and to make sure that we put positive risks in front of them, rather, because young people will take negative risks if, they're, if they present themselves. It, it's absolutely true um, that they will. And, you know, so many of us feel like we know your story now. Um, because Taylor Schilling does such an excellent job, of course, portraying you. But what does the show not reveal about you? What does it get right? What does it get wrong? What could you not convey about it in the book? Well, I think it's important for everyone to know that the character of Piper Chapman is a creation of Genji Cohan's right. writing and Taylor Schilling's acting. So... She's really not, she's not, uh, she's not even an impersonation of me. <laughs> and that's the fascinating thing about an adaptation of a memoir is mm -hmm. that ultimately the characterization by the actor or actress will be its own thing, right? It, it won't actually ever be, you know, a documentary about a person, but rather something very different. And so you see it that way very much, that mm -hmm. it is someone else's creation. So there's no identification. There's no... I certainly don't watch the character of Piper Chapman and say, oh, that's me. <laughs> sometimes I any... watch it. Sometimes I watch between my eyes and I'm like, no, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Is there anything that she does that you, do, you say, oh, yes, that's me? Oh, there... I mean, she does all kinds of stupid things. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean the stupid things. <laughs> um, you know, the character is struggling to do her best, even though sometimes she's doing incredibly stupid things or, you know, you know, she's doing, she's, she's definitely not always acting 
in her own best interest, nor even in other people's best interests. And that's an honest characterization of all of us, right? We do, you know, hopefully we're striving to be our best person, but uh, no one is all good or all bad. And we're all capable of great good, I believe, and also most of us are capable of great evil at times. Well, you know, that's and so that question about like what guides, you know, what what full steam inside of you drives those choices mm -hmm. and also what external things shape those choices is really important. There's so many questions to ask about that, but one thing also in the book that I think is uh, worth pointing out is that towards the end and, and maybe about halfway through your sentence, three quarters of the way, you realize that you were good. I thought that was very moving. You know, I think the thing about uh, failure and consequences is that uh, they can have really, they can have really profound impacts on your self-esteem and your own belief, uh, not only in your ability to sort of get things done, but even like, am I a good person? Mm -hmm. and, um, and it doesn't have to be that way because of course, our reaction to the failures which are inevitable in all of our lives, that's sort of the true test, right? Like mm -hmm. what, it, what kind of stuff are you made out of is much more driven by how you overcome or respond to your big belly flops, your big failures, than how you glow in, you know, in your greatest successes. Um, and that is something that, you know, Smith women are so incredibly accomplished and, and do amazing things here on campus and go out into the world and do amazing things. And we are so rightly focused on celebrating those successes. Mm -hmm. But it is important to uh, reassure all women who are, you know, generally striving mm -hmm. really hard that you're going to have these massive failures. And frankly, if you, if you don't have some failures in your life, you're probably not taking enough risks. And that, you know, recovery from those failures is also you know, rewarding, really rewarding. Re well, and really rewarding for all of us who, you know, love um, the show too, which is based on your story. And I have a few more questions about that. Sure. Before we do. Um, how many characters from the book are not in the show? Because so many of them are, you know, mm -hmm. yes, Yoga Janet is now Yoga Jones, et cetera, right. et cetera. But mm -hmm. are there some characters you um, maybe wish you could see in the show? Hmm. You know, they've done a really good job of mining the book. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think about anyone who has not materialized yet. They may be saving that for later. Uh, that's true. Um, <laughs> yeah, even in like that season opener for, um, for season two, like a couple of minor characters pop up and I was that's like, oh right. yeah, there she is. <laughs> um, yeah, like the crazy astrology check. Um, <laughs> The who, that was real. <laughs> um, the truth of the matter is, though, the show is very profoundly an adaptation. And so right. all the characters, even the characters who have the same names right. as real people depicted in the book, are quite a bit different. So Pensatucky is a great example. You know, the real woman who is Pensatucky quite a bit different than the character on the show <laughs> in some very significant ways. Although she did get those new teeth. Uh -huh. I was did very get the happy new teeth. to see that's that. Right. Um, and that's the interesting thing, you know, to see what Genji and the other writers, they, see, they, they cherry pick lots of details mm -hmm. or characterizations or settings from the book, and then they use them in different ways in the show. So it is very much like taking the book and putting it in a blender and putting a lot of other ingredients right. in and pressing liquefy. <gasps> it's, it's amazing. Do you um, work with them at all now on it? Do you have any, you know, do you have a role still to play? I mean, I know mm -hmm. you have credit and all that, that's, mm -hmm. that's, but tell me about yeah. that. Yeah. So I'm a consultant on the show and what that means and has meant from the very beginning is that I answer questions. So Genji comes up with questions like, how do you deal with the, you know, what's the, what mind games do you play to sort of navigate the lengthy sentence when it's looming in front of you like the Sahara Desert? And <laughs> is there cheese? I was like, why are you so interested in cheese? Um, <laughs> So they have a lot of questions, and particularly before they start scripting a season, when they're thinking about what will the season arc be, I get a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then when the scripting process starts, I read the scripts and I send feedback directly to Genji, and she decides what to do with it, so. 
Yeah. Well, there, you know, we, we were talking about this earlier as well, and um, all of these things that Genji is mining and all these details and things like wanting to know about cheese, mm -hmm. you know, very, very <laughs> important. Uh, go back to the fact that this is a community of women. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I wanted to ask you, and I think it will be fascinating to hear what you have to say, is how is the community of women in prison like the community of women at a place like Smith? Mm -hmm. Because there are similarities, aren't there? <laughs> I, I suspect that all communities of women have some similarities. And so, you know, women's good sort and of bad. deep investment. Yeah, good and bad. So, you know, I think I say in the book, like on its best days, you get like the humor and the sort of companionability and the connectedness of a rich, you know, women's community. And on the bad days, you get some hysteria, some cattiness, PMS. you know, you know, all those kinds of things, you know, those things take place. <laughs> um, I think, you know, women have a really profound investment in relationships mm -hmm. and that is true in behind the walls of a, max, a high security, mm -hmm. you know, institution and that's true behind the walls of a, an amazing institution like this. Right. Um, I think it's really important to, to consider the fact that um, I'm the product of two women's institutions and this institution is, a, is, from its very beginning, focused on helping women achieve mm -hmm. all that they are capable of achieving, whatever that might be, whatever they might want to mm -hmm. accomplish. And I can't overemphasize that a prison or a jail does not do that. Right. And so, and I also have to point out that institutions are built very intentionally yes. by society and by the, the folks who choose to build them for certain people. And so an institution like this was founded with very specific in, people in mind. I would also suggest that we build prisons and jails with very specific people in mind. Um, and that's just important because we're so fortunate to be Smithies. Yes. We're so fortunate to be able to be part of this community and not all women get, gain that good fortune. And all you have to do is walk behind the walls of a prison or a jail and you will meet an enormous number of women who don't share our good fortune. Well, and that, that's really important. Let's talk about this for a few minutes because you just said it's important to build institutions intentionally mm -hmm. for the people who are going to be in them. And so um, I, I know we're going to talk in a, a, man, a bunch of different questions about your advocacy work, but what does that mean specifically when you talk about a women's prison? What yeah. are some of the things? I mean, I think the prisons are built, um, first of all, prisons were, are rarely built with women in, in mind. So women mm -hmm. are, such a, are still such a small percentage of the prison population, generally between six and 7% mm -hmm. of any prison population, and thus very neglected by those yeah. systems. And yet, women have also been the fastest growing part of the prison population. And the rate of female incarceration in this country has grown by 800% in the last 30 years. And I know you're all thinking like, wow, I didn't know about that female crime wave. Yeah, and yeah. that's because- There wasn't one. There wasn't one, <laughs> right. Rather, as a society, we changed our priorities and we suddenly decided to lock certain people up who we had never locked up before. So people like low-level drug offenders, people who have mental illness, people who suffer right. from substance abuse, we began to put all those folks in prison and women offer a really crystallizing example of what has driven you know, this enormous explosion of the prison population. Well, one of the things that also really touched me in the book is when you and Larry are trying to prepare for your going away. You don't know when it's going to happen. And you're looking at prison survival manuals. Mm -hmm. And you say that none were out there for women. They were all written by men for men. Yeah. Uh, that seems really shocking. And so what I wanted to ask about that is, um, let's talk a little bit about some of the issues for women in prison. And let's also talk about a much bigger issue that's gonna lead us into some other places about whether women are different from men, it's, mm. it's particularly in the prison um, mm -hmm. environment. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I have spent uh, some time now in men's prisons since I came home, uh, no overnights. Um, <laughs> 
And they are fascinating places, and I hope to write my next book actually about a men's prison. And yeah. And heard it here first. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I think that, you know, it's hard for me to make an apples to apples comparison. Right. <laughs> uh, you know, what we know, we know some fundamental things that are different about women who end up in the criminal justice system. Right. And that is that three things consistently drive their in involvement in crime. And that is uh, substance abuse, a high incidence of substance abuse, mm -hmm. uh, mental illness, a very high incidence of mental illness, and a shockingly high, you know, 80% or more of women who end up in the criminal justice system or in prison have a history of sexual abuse or other physical abuse as part of their personal history, whether that is mm -hmm. during their childhood or during their adulthood. And so those are the three things which are very distinctly uh, amplified among women in the system mm -hmm. in comparison to men. And when we fail to address those at least one or sometimes right. those three things are all co-occurring. Um, we really fail to address the reason that a woman uh, is in the criminal justice system at all. So while women are in prison, I think that those relationships and the ties and connections to other people mm -hmm. are incredibly important, particularly given that prisons and jails and correctional systems work really hard to sever ties to the outside world. Right. And so people get locked up in prison and it can be exceptionally difficult to be in touch with your children, mm -hmm. with your you know, partner or spouse or uh, with other loved ones and family members. Right. And there's a variety of reasons why prisons and jails make that so difficult. So the ties and connections that you have inside the prison are very heightened and very important for women who are doing time. Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting, I recently met um, a woman named Kathy, I believe her last name is Dennehy, and she was the head of the correction system here in Massachusetts uh, during the Romney administration. And she was very interesting, and for many years she had been the warden of men's prisons. She had more than a decade, she worked in men's facilities. And then she was transferred over to work in Framingham, which is the only, you know, it's the main women's prison in, in uh, Massachusetts. And she was so struck by the differences, she said. And it, as an example, she described that it would take three times as long for her to cross the yard in Framingham because she was so frequently stopped by prisoners who wanted to talk to her. They wanted to ask her questions. They wanted to interact with her. They wanted to, you know, have a host of different interactions with her. And she said that's a huge difference. Like, women crave that connectivity even if it's to the prison warden. Even if it's to the warden, yeah, really, really different. Well, let's talk about, um, too, I know one of the things that people have been um, talking about lately is the Long Reads piece in which Lauren Morelli talks about how working on Orange is the New Black helped her realize her true sexuality, her true orientation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she is now in a relationship with the uh, actress who plays Pusse and um, very happy. And this is something that I, I think we need to talk about because you identify as bisexual. Mm -hmm. And there are many people, um, gay and straight, who don't give enough credibility to the bisexual orientation. And I want to discuss why, at a point in your life when you're happily married mm -hmm. um, and the mother of two children, that it's important you disclose this information. Well, I don't think it was a disclosure. I feel uh, oh, sure. <laughs> that's what I mean. You know, when I was here on, on campus, uh, I was very actively involved with what was then called the LBA, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, the Lesbian Bisexual Alliance. And so, and during my entire adult life, you know, that was sort of a fundamental part of my identity. So when I moved to San Francisco, mm -hmm. you know, I was out at work, which is easier in San Francisco than some other places. Right. Um, one of my ex-girlfriends from Smith is, has re recently relocated back to Alabama, where she is from, and she's making a documentary film about the LGBTQ community there, oh, and it fantastic. is, you know, a world of difference between yes. the coasts and some other parts of this country. Um, so, yeah, and then, of course, I did, you know, meet Larry Smith, who ended up, you know, being, you know, we've been together for 18 years, mm -hmm. we've been married for eight, so... Uh, it's not as though that part of my identity evaporates, though it is, you know, sort of less, it has less currency, um, though that is no longer true, 
<laughs> people are suddenly very interested in my ancient, you know, in like ancient history when it comes to my, my sex life, exactly. which is sort of entertaining and novel. Um, <laughs> I just turned 45. I'm like, oh my god. It's kind of cool. You know, you in know? terms of like, you know, the real Alex or you know Nora as she is called in the book. Right. Um, you know, though the other thing that is funny in terms of like comparing Piper Chapman to Piper Kerman's real life is that like I had a lot of girlfriends. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I didn't okay. have one girlfriend. Let's set <laughs> okay? the record straight. <laughs> so. <I'm> like, <laughs> Hot. She is hot. <laughs> that is just it, another thing you're talking about with Larry. And that's so funny. Is a lot of people think, of course, um, they conflate Larry Smith with Jason Biggs. Mm. And I just want everyone to know, if you haven't read the book, Larry's a really good guy. Okay. <laughs> he is. He's. The, he's the. I often say he's the hero of the piece, and people are like, "What?" <laughs> no, it's um. true. And but that's an, another reason why I was asking you this question because something in the book, and, and if you haven't read it, read it, buy it today, get it signed, read it, is that your story with Larry really shows how fluid sexuality and sexual identity is. Mm -hmm. That you can fall in love with someone and you fall in love with the person. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter, you know, it's mm -hmm. not about anything. It's not about any particular parts or this or that, mm -hmm. although sometimes it can be. <laughs> but it's a very beautiful um, sort of, friendship that you fell into and it did take a long time didn't it for the two of you oh yeah we were friends for two years mm -hmm. um and you know i think i was dating a, a woman who was in law school which i don't recommend <laughs> uh it's miserable law school i mean um go to law school if you want but don't date a law student um and uh, and then that relationship ended, and he was involved in a relationship that ended, and we again we were friends for a long time before mm -hmm. we became intimately involved. Um, yes, I think se sexuality is often very fluid. I think there's a big spectrum of human sexuality, mm -hmm. so I think that's one of the things that's really nice about the show is that it puts that you know front and center, um, and and I think that's great. Well, another thing that is interesting about your life now is that you have children. And uh, you have some scenes in the book, and just like in the show where um, Dianara is um, pregnant, mm -hmm. uh, you have a character in the book who does give birth. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think one of the things that you talk about quite eloquently is this issue of women in prison mm -hmm. with children, mm -hmm. whether they're pregnant, whether they've just given birth, whether their children are in their 20s. Mm -hmm. And now that you're a mother, how has that changed your view of what it must be like for those women? I mean, while I was incarcerated, you know, the, vet, the majority of women in prison are mothers, and the majority of those mothers are the mothers of minor children. Mm -hmm. And so um, that separation uh, imposed by a prison sentence is very devastating mm -hmm. on those women, and it's extremely devastating for those families and those kids. And you see that manifest itself every day in terms of, you know, people crying on the payphone or women, you know, worrying about the welfare of their children who are far away from them and for whom they can do very little um, while they're incarcerated. And I have to reiterate, most women are incarcerated for nonviolent offenses. Two thirds of all women are in prison for nonviolent offenses. So the, that sort of calculus of the merits of that confinement, the, that incarceration, are, I think, very debatable. Um, while I was incarcerated, I was not a mother, right. and, and yet it was so clear to me that the central type of relationship that is most relevant to the experience of women's incarceration is the maternal relationship. Mm -hmm. As hot as, you know, some of the lesbian sex is in the show, <laughs> uh, and, you know, of course, you know, sexual relationships are totally present in a prison, of course, but that maternal relationship is really, really profoundly important and one of the most damaging things about the rise of the incarceration of women. Um, you know, yeah, since coming home, I, I have become a mother and the idea of having to, of being separated from my child is, is so overwhelming. It's, it gives me even more respect for the women I know, knew who were doing time. I mean, I had a lot of respect at the time. I was like, wow, that is right. intense and seems so hard. But now I feel like on, on a factor of, I don't know, a thousand. Um, it's a big mistake. 
uh, you know, those families that are most affected by incarceration tend to be our families from our most vulnerable communities, our poorest communities. Those families may, in some cases, be pretty fragile families. And the idea that incarceration is going to help those kids in any way is a big mistake. It really is. And uh, I want to point out before asking you one last question before turning things over to oh. you all, is that um, you know part of today's proceeds are benefiting the Women's Prison Association. Yeah. I'm very, very happy um, about that. And so here we are in an institution that we've already discussed, and you and I know is a, an elite and privileged one. Mm -hmm. um, we are all very fortunate to be part of it. And what can we do, um, elite, privileged people of mm -hmm. the Smith community, what are some of the ways that you would say we can get involved and think about this? Some really actionable things. Mm -hmm. Just wondering if you've, if you've got a, a sure. few for us to think about. Yeah. I mean, I think a central recognition, especially for people who have a lot of privilege and power, mm -hmm. is to recognize and acknowledge that the criminal justice system has been used very intentionally as a tool of control over poor communities and especially poor communities of color. And mm -hmm. that that is in fact a misuse of the criminal justice system. That's not actually what it's supposed to be for. <laughs> um, and so anything that those who have a lot of power can do to change that and to influence policymakers and also, you know, just other, you know, public opinion and other members of the public, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of the, the very first step, you can't actually change that reality of, you know, inequality and in some cases abuse within the system without recognizing it and acknowledging it. And that still in some quarters is politically challenging. Right. So, but in the nitty gritty of our own lives, there are lots of things that we can do. And it sort of depends on whether someone has a personal investment or whether they're more politically oriented. So on a personal level, one can do something as simple as donate books to a prison book project. You know, it's a simple, it's really a simple and easy thing to do. Um, but so meaningful, like prisoners are voracious readers. There are little, to, there are little to no educational programs in prisons. Mm -hmm. You know, there are GED programs, which may or may not be good. And there's virtually no college education, you know, in uh, prisons since, since they took away Pell Grants in the 90s. So, when prisoners are seeking to educate themselves, which is the number one thing that keeps people out of prison, um, they have to do it on their own steam. So donating some, doing something like just donating those books that are piling up, unless you're all on e-readers now, I'm not sure. Um, something like that is great. Someone who wants to invest a little bit more time, someone who is more curious, can volunteer their time because there is a prison or a jail in almost every community in this country. And so to give a little bit of yourself in that context is an amazing thing to do. And all the people I've ever known who do prison volunteering ine inevitably say, I get more out of it than, than they do. But that's not entirely true. <laughs> um, another thing, if you're not comfortable going into a prison and jail, is that you can mentor someone on the outside. And that's a really powerful thing to do as well, to mentor someone coming home from prison or jail or to mentor someone like a young person who might be at risk and of going into the away. criminal justice. Exactly. On the political side, the most important thing to do is know this. Elected officials are the last movers, not the first movers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, while we do have some wonderful elected officials out there who we, you know, everyone's always very fond of their own rep, right? Right. The truth of the matter is that rarely will they lead on these issues. They will follow when they feel like these, um, these kinds of reforms are politically tenable. And so it's really important to let elected officials know that you want more sensible public safety approaches and that a shared goal of not having the biggest prison population in human history, and certainly mm -hmm. the biggest prison population in the world, is something that they should prioritize. Excellent. Thank you so much, Piper. And I want to make sure we have plenty of time. And I'll just, just a couple of housekeeping notes. There are two microphones set up. And there are student volunteers who will help you get to the microphones and keep um, lines for questions moving. But um, if you know your question 
is a little amorphous. I may help reshape it. I may re-ask it and just ask for everyone's patience as we get through these because we have um, some good time for this now. So please. Okay, and I will take questions Whoops. silly and serious, okay? <laughs> Don't be and thank shy. thank you all for being here. <laughs> They're are discussing they, are they their questions. Are they lining up or are they leaving? <laughs> I think some of them are leaving and some of them are lining up. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, is this working? No. It's Just fine. give it a couple of minutes until okay. you know, the transition is made. <coughs> okay. I'm just waiting a moment for everyone to settle down and get out the doors and then we'll get started. I'm going to start on this side, so just so all set. All righty. All right. First question. Hi, my name is Bonnie. Hi, Bonnie. It's truly my pleasure to meet you. Oh, thank you. I enjoyed your book very much. It resonated deeply with me. I have a personal experience with a family member with the prison system. Mm -hmm. So I have actually two questions. One, do you really feel like, I'm, I'm thankful you're an advocate, mm -hmm. a high profile advocate. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like you're making a difference? Are, are you making inroads? Because the system is just so devastating uh -huh. to so many people. Yeah. And um, so I'd be really interested to hear how you feel about that since you're um, rise in fame. Mm -hmm. And then also on a more light uh, note, I'd love to know if you keep in touch with POP. Oh, over yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, I'll answer the first one first because it's easy. Um, yes, the answer is yes. Uh, I do keep in touch with her. Um, she, you know, she's had her struggles coming home, and, but she's, she's hanging in there. And yeah, we're still... We're so close, definitely. I love her. Um, that's why I dedicated the book to her, in part. Um, and as far as your other question, uh, I would tell you this. I am optimistic, but I am not unrealistic about the nature of our challenge in terms of uh, the jargon that some people in the field, which I don't encourage people to use jargon, is decarcerating. So, you know, we built up this incredible you know, we went from 500,000 prisoners in 1980 to 2.4 million prisoners today. Oh it's formidable to sort of deconstruct that, um, particularly given that there are entities in our society now which have serious skin in the game, right? They have a lot of economic stake in maintaining, actually, a huge prison population when there is a great deal of money to be made from that, from that enormous state. Um, that said, you know, we have so overbuilt our prison population and our prison systems that states can no longer afford them. And actually that has driven much of the reform that has happened in the last 10 years. And there has been a lot of reform in the last 10 years, and that's part of the reason I'm optimistic. So states like California, which has the biggest economy, I believe, in the country, spend $9 billion a year on prisons and $6 billion a year on higher education. And they spend $62,000 per year per prisoner and $9,000 per year per K through 12 student. And that just seems like a really foolish social investment, doesn't it? And I do believe that more people are awakening to how incredibly costly both in an economic sense and in a human sense and in the harm that it causes to our community. Um, but it is going to be, be a significant effort to deconstruct that. And what it will require is a lot of organizing on the ground uh, because, you know, a lot of elites and sort of like thought leaders, there's been a lot of consensus about the failures of the criminal justice system for a long time. 
but you know, you really do have to build political will to make that change, because legislative change is like making sausage. Thank Gross. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> right over here. Thank you very much for sharing Thank your you, story. Thank you, Bonnie. Thanks. Hi, I'm Isabella. Hi. Um, I was wondering uh, if you're allowed to vote. <coughs> ah, good question. Felony disenfranchisement. I live in New York State, and in New York State, uh, you are allowed to vote if you're on federal probation or if you've completed your probation. If you are on parole, state parole, you're not allowed to vote until you complete your state parole. But I am allowed to vote. Now, all over this country, there's millions of Americans who have lost their right to vote because they have a criminal conviction, regardless of whether they did prison time or not, because they have a criminal conviction. It may not surprise you that that practice really has its origins in the southern states and that felony disenfranchisement maps really closely to states that have significant African-American populations because felony disenfranchisement has been used to suppress voting among minority communities and that's how it continues to be used. So, yeah, so if I move to a different state though, I could, use, I could lose my right to vote uh, potentially for my entire life. So, but it's like a patchwork quilt. Good question. Thank, Thank you. you. Over here. Hi, um, my name is Camilla and uh, I'm a theater major. And so I was wondering um, if you could talk a little bit more about what sort of specific stuff you did, what productions you were in and how that impacted your writing later on in mm -hmm. your career. Oh, gosh. Um, I was assistant director on the Colored Museum, which was directed by Andrea Hairston, who I believe is still teaching. Yay! Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> She's my advisor. Uh, that was an epically amazing production. Um, and I performed, the only play in which I performed was uh, Emily Mann's Execution of Justice, which is about the murder of Dan, no, the murder by Dan White, um, of Harvey um, Milk and George Moscone. And it's a fascinating play, and that was also an amazing production. Um, and so those are the two that are co totally top of mind. Um, while I was here, I really delved into playwriting and dramaturgy and theater history. Um, and, you know, I just had a great time. Lived over there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Alex, and I've sort of got a silly question and a more serious question. Bring it. So, silly question is, in the book, the most memorable scene to me was the one in which you got into an altercation with that woman at the salad bar. Salad bar. <laughs> so, yep. I've got to ask, considering that you were in prison, why did you make such an affair over the lettuce? The lettuce. Well... It was the spinach. Yeah, it was the <laughs> spinach. There was spinach that day. That was very unusual. So the integrity of the body is a big... To, the experience of incarceration, like, a huge thing, a huge question is the integrity of the body. So you go to prison, you are transformed from Piper Kerman into 11187424. Everything about a prisoner in jail is designed to sort of leech away your humanity a bit in one way or another. Um, you are strip searched, sometimes repeatedly. Like you have no expectation of integrity of the body when you are a prisoner. And so, and that extends to, you know, being told where you'll sleep, what you, you know, what time you'll get up, what time you'll go to bed, you know, everything you can think about, is, about your life is controlled in some very uh, defined way. And you have very limited choice about the food you put in the body. And the food in prison is exceptionally unhealthy, which is ironic because you have a higher percentage of people in prison who suffer from chronic illnesses, um, like diabetes or heart disease and you know, a host of others. Um, so, you know, that the choice while I was incarcerated control of my own body became something I was a little obsessed with in a way that I had never been before in my life. Um, and so that manifested in terms of things like running down on the track, which was like the big head clearer, like make space, like take care of myself thing. And you know, in trying to really intentionally not put food in the body that was gonna ultimately harm me. And so my excitement over that spinach on the salad bar was so significant. And that confrontation with the other woman over that spinach was a very heightened moment for me. And I was just really lucky that that other woman stepped in. 
<laughs> Thank you. All Great right. Question. I think, yes, okay. <laughs> Do you have another question? Yeah, it, this is, I guess, a bit more serious. But, okay. Um, Considering, I guess, there's lots of crossover, what do you have to say about, like, legalization of marijuana as mm -hmm. well as, like, potentially other yeah. drugs? So I think that there is no scientific support for why, if we have, if alcohol is legal in this country, there's no medical or scientific support for why marijuana should be illegal. I think uh, it seems really clear that that's the direction things are heading in, at least on a state-by-state -state basis. I think that we are going to learn an enormous amount from what happens in Colorado and what's happening in Washington, like the states that have already legalized and other states will do it as well. And that will tell us, if we're smart, that will tell us a lot about how we should handle more harmful drugs like methamphetamine and cocaine and heroin and other drugs that we know, you know, in fact, have far, great, you know, far more significant health harms than marijuana. Does that make sense? Yeah. Great. Um, hi, I'm Nick. I'm also a theater major. Um, I do set design. So I was curious as a fellow theater person and someone who seems to be um, very involved in, I guess, like the entertainment business, what your feelings are on the, the age old debate of do I give in to adaptation and get fame or do I stick to my original creative idea and sort of I guess, I don't know if I want to call it integrity, because you don't lose integrity by adapting something, but cre keeping that same, like, creative feel that you brought to it. And, I mean, there's a reason that you created it the way you did and didn't adapt it to the way, you know, someone else did. Uh-huh. Hmm. Interesting. Tricky question. I think, um, you know, sort of chasing fame is probably generally going to either not be successful or else is going to deliver you something really unsatisfying. Not you personally, right. but like a person. <laughs> And, you know, generally, you know, investing yourself in a creative endeavor that has integrity is something that you will be able to live with um, regardless of its, of its reception. Does that make sense? I think so, yeah. Great. Perfect. Thank Good you. question. Hi, Piper. Um, Hi. My name is Emily, and I am a sophomore, and I live in Chapin House. Oh, Chapin House! <laughs> Go Chapin. Which floor? Uh, well, I'm on 410. For, oh, um, fourth, I lived on the fourth floor. Ooh, so that was my question, <laughs> actually. Um, what rooms did you live <laughs> in in Chapin? Uh, which, what was the question? What rooms do you live in? Oh, did you so, in? Uh, God, I can't remember the number of my first year, but it was on the third floor, back facing. There's that little suite. There's two uh -huh. small, you know, rooms. And then uh, my senior, year, not my my sophomore year, um, one of the giant, huge uh, fourth floor rooms that looks out over the lawn. I can't remember the numbers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was huge that room. It's sort of L shaped. Did it have a circle window? What? Uh, no, I didn't have the circle window. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Hi, my name is Pearl. Um, Hi, Pearl. My question is, do you believe in prison abolition? Uh, do I believe in it? Uh, like, like the Easter Bunny? I'm kidding. <laughs> That's a mean joke. Um, I do, well, do I believe in it? You know, it's a very interesting question. I don't believe in it in practical terms. Like, do I think I'll see it, see it in my lifetime, assuming that I live 45 more years? Um, no, I'm skeptical about that. Do, Do I believe that it is a worthy, uh, that it's an important part of the spectrum of intellectual discourse about prisons to be able to envision a society without prisons and jails? Yes, I believe that is very important. So I think that prison abolition has a really important place in the debate. Um, I am a pretty nitty gritty realist and I do feel like I'm 45 years old and I'm not going to be here forever and I want to see a lot of change during the, I want to see whatever change I can help contribute to and foster during the time that I'm here on this earth. So, so my sort of set of, you know, f you know, my focus is generally not on prison abolition because I think I'm going to turn 90 and die and we will ma have made a lot of progress, but I don't think we will have abolished prisons. I think, though, also it's an interesting question. I have this conversation all the time with my dear friend, 
Joe Loya. Hello, baby. Um, <laughs> my friend Joe Loya is uh, a bank robber. He's robbed like 20 banks, 21 banks actually. He did about seven years of Fed time and a bunch of state time, so he did more than 10 years in prison. He was implicated in a prison murder where he was held in the shoe for two years. Like, he's a hardcore guy. He didn't, he didn't commit that murder. <laughs> he didn't kill, he didn't do that, but he was accused and, and held in solitary confinement for two years. Um, he's an amazing person. He completely transformed his life. Writing literally saved his life while he was in the shoe. He began a uh, correspondence with Richard Rodriguez, the writer Richard Rodriguez. Um, and he's an amazing person and a writer who wrote his own memoir called The Man Who Outgrew His Prison Cell. And he and I talk about, talked about prison abolition not so long ago. I saw him and he said his opinion, he was like, no. And his opinion is this, prisons could be so different than they are in the United States. So all you have to do is go to a place like Norway and you'll find that they are dramatically different or most parts of Europe actually. And so what Joe said is this, he, it was an interesting way that he put it. He said, some people don't play well with others and they need places where they can be that they can learn how to play better with others. And that's his perspective on the best case scenario for um, a prison that is a productive part of our society. So that was a really long-winded answer to your question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And? Hi, my name is Sarah, and I'm sending you Chapin Love. I think by your description, <laughs> I live in the room that you used to live in. Oh! 407. Cool. Um, but my question is about the buy erasure on Orange is the New Black, uh -huh. and how you feel personally about how there's kind of this structured dichotomy of, oh, I like, I like hot women, I like hot men, I don't know, I like hot people, mm -hmm. but then also questions like, oh, are you a lesbian now? And that kind of thing, mm -hmm. where the show kind of neglects to accept the fact that you can love all sorts of people regardless of mm -hmm. gender. Mm. I mean, I think the show depicts a huge, uh, you know, a broad swath of human sexuality. And so the question of like endorsement or language choices around that I don't mean to dismiss or suggest that language choices aren't really significant and important, but, um, but on some level, like, it, it exhibits or shows all kinds of different sexual proclivities, sexual behaviors, you know, that spectrum. Um, so, you know, the character, there are characters who are really clearly bisexual, yeah. which is fundamentally true. So I think your question about whether those characters in the characterizations that are made adopt that, that label, um, you know, is an interesting question. I think, I can't answer it directly because I don't write the show, right? I, but I did write the book. So um, one of the things that I labored to do in the book was to use the language that was most representative of the experience as opposed to the language that, uh, that we might assign in other contexts. Does that make sense? So I didn't, want to use, I didn't want to use language in writing about the prison experience that wouldn't actually get used in prison. So I do think that you're right. Bisexuality is very unapparent in our, in our society, and that's something that we could address. And so I think a lot of creative, I mean, if we, Genji was here with us, she might say, well, I've created these characters who are clearly bisexual, and yet I don't think, you know, it might be her opinion, I don't think those women would adopt that term. And that might be her point of view. I don't know. I'm not telling you that that's how it is. Um, but I think it's good to have those characters, right? Sure. Or at least I hope it is. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Haley. Hi. Um, I want to know if you agree with me, or think, I guess, that there's kind of a vindictive impulse in American culture nowadays because, because I mean, I, I think that the prison system benefits people who want to control poorer populations, populations of color. Mm -hmm. But I also think there's a significant kind of thought process that goes like these people have done something bad and now it's time for them to get what's coming to them yeah, sure. rather than an impulse to like, you know, heal what's, what's gone wrong. You know, yes. like they're like people who support the death penalty. Like that's clearly not about improving culture. That's just about punishment. Right. Yes. I mean, yes, I think the American correctional system and the American criminal justice system is deeply founded on the concept of, of 
pure punishment and not on a concept of rehabilitation. And I think we have a lot of variability in this country in terms of like who should we punish and who does, shouldn't we punish. So, you know, if you had, let's say we had two young men right this moment in time, actually, we might find two young men committing the exact same crime, right? Let's just say two young 19-year-old men selling drugs, which is a crime that we have sent millions and millions of Americans to jail, to prison or jail for. So if one of those young men lives in public housing and the other young man lives in his fraternity house or his dorm, I promise you they will be treated very differently by the criminal justice system. You know, one of those young men is very unlikely to be policed at all. And one of those young men is very likely to be policed. And when you get to prosecution and sentencing and penalties, sentencing, we know for a fact, because actually the data shows it, that different Americans will be prosecuted differently and they'll be sentenced differently. And so black and Latino defendants who are similarly situated to white defendants, apples to apples comparisons, are more likely to be offered harsher plea deals and 95% of defendants plea. And, uh, black and African and Latino defendants are more likely to be sentenced to prison than, than an apples to apples comparison to a white defendant. So there's no question about that. Yep. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, Piper. My name's Samantha. Oh. Hi. Um, I just had a question if you still talk to any of the Louder. Women. I had a question if you still talk to any of the women you were incarcerated with. The women that I was incarcerated with? Yes, many of them. Not all, not every, well, obviously I was incarcerated with hundreds and hundreds of women, but yeah. yes. There's many of the women who are depicted in the book who are still mm -hmm. part of my life and really an important part of my life. Thank, Thank. you. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Anyone? Oh, oh, is that it? <laughs> oh my goodness. I, I guess it is. <laughs> <laughs> I hope, oh, there ah, we go. There we go. <laughs> I hope you'll all join me in thanking both Piper and Beth Ann for being with us this afternoon.